So you can see it's got a pointy bit at the end there. That's really for stabbing someone through the visor, under the chin, in the armpits, the groin, thighs, anywhere where your arm is disjointed. The guy would then fall over and you get your short sword out and sort of finish him off. Welcome to the podcast where we track down Australian war veterans, have a chat with them and hear their stories. I'm Alex Lloyd and this is Life on the Line. The single greatest sacrifice I've made is my family. There were a couple of public beheadings. In order to kill them, you've got to be a little bit angry. Not psychotic, but just angry. We could look down the Frankfurt and see it on fire. Stuff blowing up everywhere. There will be no surrender. And then they had to fight an enemy in amongst we got children. Point where you were going to I could never not go back. They were my friends and they felt the top of us. She did say, you've changed. A soldier put everything on the line to help one of our blokes. Welcome to a bonus episode of Life on the Line. My guest today is Tim Rayson, the axe keeper of Her Majesty's Bodyguard of the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms. It is quite a business card. My conversation with Tim is about the role of the axe keeper, the history of the guard, a bit of a tour of St. James's Palace and the axes and some other cool history within, and more. Tim Rayson, welcome to the podcast. Hi, Alex. So, Tim, you have a rather cool job title, the axe keeper. Let's talk about your role here first. My job, if you like, is I'm the administrator for the bodyguard and historically the axe keeper would take the axes to the place of duty for the members of the bodyguard to pick up, go on duty and then come off duty again. So it's really a, a, an admin role. I suppose in modern parlance, it's like being the assistant adjutant, the RSM, the RQMS, the chief clerk and the chief bottle washer all rolled into one. And today we're talking about the axes in quite a ceremonial sense, but as we'll get into, the, the use of the axes in the past could uh, have a more varied function. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Terrorist just kebab. And how long have you been with the Guard, Tim? Um, I've been here nine years now, 10th uh, year about to arrive. So I've been here quite some time. Man. So, Tim, Her Majesty's Bodyguard of the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms. What is it? When and how did it come about? The Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms was formed by Henry VIII in 1509. And the background to it was that in medieval warfare, you never quite knew if the army was going to turn against you or not, uh, if it was going to fight for you or not. And your best friends could be your worst enemies. As Richard II or Richard III found out at the Battle of Bosworth uh, in 1485, when at a crucial point in the battle, a large portion of the king's army changed sides from his side to Henry Tudor. And that's why Richard lost. But he didn't have a personal escort. He had no close bodyguard. And I suppose in modern parlance, the after action review would say uh, that that was a bit of a um, bit of a thing that needed to be sorted out before you went to battle again, went off to fight another war. Henry VII, as he then became, decided to create a personal bodyguard. And that was formed from a company of Welsh archers. And that, the idea being they are the last line of defence before you get to the king. And they're pledged directly, personally, to the king. Correct. Appointed to the king's uh, household. They did a fairly good job. They're known as the oldest guard because they're still in existence today. Queen or the king's bodyguard of the yeoman of the guard. They might look like the beef eaters, by the way, but they're, they're not. They are completely different and separate from them. And Henry VIII was very, uh, Henry VII, sorry, was very tight with his money. So he thought a company of Welsh archers was pretty good value for money. They were cheap. And of course, the longbow, a very good kinetic weapon out to about 300 metres. It would certainly stop trooper cavalry. And if you were dismounted, absolutely, totally deadly. Um, so, yeah, you had a, it was a pretty good uh, weapon system. Now, however, let's roll forward to 1509 and Henry VIII. What he wanted was something that was new, a sumptuous troop of gentlemen composed of cadets of noble families and the higher order of the gentry. Not quite as frugal either as Henry VII. You're right. He was a bit of a spendthrift, like splashing the money out. But he wanted something really seriously upmarket. And so he created a thing called the Band of Spears. That's what we were originally known as, the Band of Spears. But that soon changed the gentlemen pensioners. And they were the king's personal bodyguard, the close-in bodyguard. He didn't want to be left behind by the people. And the King of France, of course, who are chief enemy of the period and continued to be, had a really super-duper swept-up bodyguard 
called the Guide du Corps, and they were really smart, and Henry wanted to go one better. So that's why he created the Band of Spears. There was also a tactical imperative in all of this, in as much that the king or the sovereign still went onto the field of battle to command the army, and the army used to form up in three lines, or three battles, as they were known as. Once the army had formed up, then the yeoman of the guard would march on onto the field and hold the ground, as it was the phrase that was used, and we still use that today. So they would go on and form a square secure area, and then the sovereign would arrive with the gentleman pensioners as the close escort. So if you like, four lines between the king and the enemy, or five, sorry. And that's how we do it today. So for example, when we have a garden party or whether we're doing state ceremonial, the yeoman of the guard always march on first to hold the ground. We then come on with the sovereign. That goes back to that period of time. At its institution, the king ordained that the 50 gentlemen each have an archer as part of their team, a demi lance spear carrier, and a castrel, an orderly. And every spear had to have three great horses. So he could go to war and ride around with the king, because the king used to go around on progresses around the country. That was the only way of communicating the king's uh, likeness to the population at large. Also, listeners, we can't control the clocks here, so you might hear the odd chime. Sorry in advance for that. So that sounds like quite an uh, accompaniment that the king has. It doesn't not just the immediate bodyguard, but each of those bodyguard members or gentlemen have their own bodyguard. troops, yeah, bodyguards own underneath troops them. As well, yes. The bodyguards have bodyguards. Yeah, yeah. Indeed. And of course, when the court moved off for a progress, for example, up in St. James's Palace, all the tapestries which are up there, all the Holbein tapestries would be taken off the walls and rolled up and they would go with you. Quite an effort to host his or her majesty. Yeah, absolutely right. And frightfully expensive, frightfully expensive, with no benefit at the end of it. Well, within four years of their formation, the guard was taken into battle. Yeah, it was uh, one of our periodic uh, bun fights with the French. Interestingly, at that time, England was Catholic, wasn't Protestant, and we were aligned with uh, the Holy Roman Emperor, Maximilian V, fighting against the French as part of an alliance. Funny old thing, that. They were laying siege to a town called Truim, and the French decided to send a relief column with food and stuff. So each one of their horsemen, and they're all mounted, had bags of food hanging off the horses. But there were quite a lot, there were about two or 3,000 of them. And so the king led the army out of the camp and they formed up to give battle. The French, having seen this, sort of stopped and thought, hmm. The English charged with the horses and the king's bodyguard in close attendance, obviously, and put the French to flight. They didn't stay to fight, they just ran away. And it's called the Battle of Guingat is its correct title, but the Battle of the Spurs is its informal title because all you could see galloping away were the French horses and the spurs of the riders glinting in the sun. And this wasn't a short gallop away from the battlefield. This went on for about 10 or 15 miles. So it was a really long pursuit. So when the English joke about French, say, a 20th century context, that's really got a lot of more longer history behind it as well. Uh, yeah, you're talking about Monty Python. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah indeed. Yes. Yeah. I was making sure. a very serious cultural reference there. Yeah, yeah. I'm not sure the Pythons actually were aware of that piece of history. But anyway, it doesn't matter. It, yeah, it chimes with it. Another highlight of the Guard's early years was at the Field of the Cloth of Gold in 1520. Yeah, a Field of Cloth of Gold was um, an enormous diplomatic conference, almost like the Vienna Peace Conference after the Bonaparte Wars or the Treaty of Versailles, the Versailles Conference after the Great War. It was that scale of thing, um, except what they did is they took everything with them. So they set up and built a plywood castle and entertainment areas and everything else on this place in France. And the two monarchs got together, a bit like Trump and Kim, I suppose, in you know, really modern day parlance, to try and sort themselves out and become friends and all the rest of it. But of course, there was a whole, always that rivalry in there, who's got the smartest bodyguard and all that sort of stuff. Yeah, they, they all had a good time, but it all went slightly wrong when Henry decided to challenge the, the French king to a wrestling match. Of course, Henry being a big guy, he lost and Henry wasn't very happy with that. An actual royal wrestling match. A royal wrestling match, yeah. So they had a royal wrestling match. Henry got thrown to the ground. His uh, staff had to restrain him because he went white with anger. <laughs> so there could have been, you know, serious damage done at that peace conference. And after that, it all sort of finished. and Everyone went their separate ways, unreconciled. 
And don't forget, these, these things were really visual, and it was, that was the only way of communicating your power and your influence, which is why you know, everyone was dressed up in immaculate clothing and all the rest. Cloth of gold is a real thing, and people were wearing loads of it at the time. In 1526, there was a noticeable change to how the guard operated. What was that? Yeah, well, it was at that time we'd started to undertake more dismounted duties. And one of the privileges the bodyguard had was actually to carry up the meat to the king's table, so to wait personally on the king. Because we were doing more dismounted duties, having a lance or long spear really didn't quite work because, you know, it was about 14 foot long. That really used to get in the way. So in the end, they sort of swapped that for an axe, for a battle axe. And that battle axe was a classical axe with a you know, chopping end. That was it. That was a war axe. It then morphed much later into something called a poleaxe. And the word pole is the medieval word for head. So it was a head axe. That's where the phrase being poleaxed, i.e. stunned, is derived from. Now, not many people use that phrase poleaxed today. In fact, if you actually ask any young people, I'm not that old, but if you ask any young people what the word poleaxed stands, poleaxed, stands for, they'll, they'll go, what? But that's where it comes from. Being poleaxed comes from being hit on the head by one of the axes, by a poleax. And you mentioned, for example, then just bringing the king dinner. And I think that we've just talked about a couple of battles and that kind of thing involved yeah. with, but they're also, they are the bodyguard in a battle context when necessary, or even just a semi-ceremonial, semi-protective role when on the move. But then when at home or just in court, it is just a ceremonial duty in a sense. And there's a, they have to switch from that combat role to that home domestic role almost. Yeah, that's, that's quite true. Obviously, I, we didn't go to war all the time. It might have seemed like it, but we didn't. Because wars, as they are today, was frighteningly expensive. And so, yes, they did a lot of peacetime stuff. And that's why one of the officer appointments that we have today in the bodyguard actually dates back, his job title dates back to that time, and that is the Harbinger. Now, everyone knows about the Harbinger of doom, uh, the finger of bad news. Well, he's the Harbinger of good news because he's the quartermaster. And his job specifically was to go ahead, find the accommodation for the bodyguard, the food, replacement horses, all that sort of stuff. That was his job as the harbinger. Although we were just talking about domestic duties, there were more battle honours to be won by the bodyguard in 1544. Yeah, that was uh, just at the siege of Boulogne, really. Um, and like all sieges, it went its way. But Henry was in the process of slowly but surely dying. He only had about another, I think was another four years to go before he was finished. And they wanted to hang on to Boulogne and, and Calais as well. Because Henry VIII inherited this siege from Henry VII. He did, yeah. He hung on and it wasn't until really Edward VI came on the scene with an Queen Mary that actually we withdrew essentially from the continent completely. What happens to the guard then over the next 100 years? From Henry's time until really the next epoch, there's two. One is the very short-lived reign of Edward VI, and followed by Queen Mary, followed by Queen Elizabeth I, who lasted 45 years. But you had these two short reigns in the middle. Edward VI was the son of Henry, Henry VIII, but he was quite a sickly child, although apparently really quite nasty and, you know, quite vicious, apparently, as, as a kid, but he never grew up. Both he and Queen Mary had insurrections or rebellions during their period of time, and the bodyguard turned out for both of those to protect them. So they were the bodyguard was well thought of by both those two sovereigns. Interestingly, the bodyguard actually did fight in another battle called the Battle of the Pinky, which is in Scotland in 1547, though the king wasn't there. The Lord Protector, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, was there, and therefore he attracted as part of his assets, the king's bodyguard. And for those historians that are really interested in it, well, it was a very interesting combined operation, land forces and naval operating together on a, on a battlefield. A bit like Gallipoli, but not an opposed landing. But interestingly, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset, then led the rebellion against the king uh, in 1550. And the bodyguard turned out in Hyde Park, just up the road from here, with the train bands to protect the king. His uh, rebellion didn't get very far, um, but they, had all, they were all ready to go. He was the brother of Jane Seymour, Henry's third wife. He'd beheaded his own brother in part of the power struggle to become the law protector. But having failed, he was captured and, of course, suffered the fate of all traitors. He was executed himself. But the king died the following year. Along comes Queen Mary, 
English politics. Um, we're going to dive into a little bit of a rabbit hole here, but it's quite important. Henry VIII had turned the UK from being a Roman Catholic based religion into a Protestant religion. For all those wives. That's what the king wanted, and that's the way, that's the way it was. And Catholics were sort of rooted out and got rid of by killing or exile. Edward VI was Church of England, so that was fine. Nothing really changed on the religion front. But Queen Mary was a staunch Catholic and was due to get married to the King of Spain, Philip II of Spain, who sent the Armada against us. A lot of the, uh, a, a proportion of the population said, this is not right. And so they had the White, Thomas Wyatt Rebellion. That sort of fizzled out, mainly because the, the support was rather, was patchy. Again, the, uh, the traitors, as they were known as, were captured and suffered the fate of all traitors, being hung, drawn, and subsequently quartered, head on a spike on top of Tower Bridge, or on top of the Tower of London, which is what happened during those days. But Queen Mary died four years later, having married Philip. King Philip wouldn't come to England because he knew how unpopular it would be. So Princess Elizabeth became Queen Elizabeth and then reigned for 45 years. So we had a period of consistent peace and economic growth, mainly through piracy against Spain, I hadn't to add, but you know, that's the way it was in those days. Well, you just mentioned there a succession of rulers. I suppose the bodyguard, it's not loyal to a particular individual. And when the next king or queen comes in, they have to clean house. It's not like that. I suppose in modern parlance, we could look at uh, American Secret Service. They're loyal to whoever the president is. And when an election happens, the next one comes in, they just serve the office of the president. Would that be a fair comparison of the bodyguard? No, it doesn't, because we are actually appointed by the sovereign. So, for example, my appointment will lapse. When the sovereign dies, all of us... You're out of a job. We're out of a job. And that has all sorts of interesting constitutional implications, like who swears in the new bodyguard. So the sovereign gets coronated and then they appoint the next... No, it's all done before. So on the day of death, so the next in line of the throne is the king. We become the king's bodyguard and we have to swear allegiance to the king. So you lose a job and then you can immediately reapply to get it back again. Yeah, okay. indeed. And the very final time the bodyguards see active combat is in 1642, and it's quite dramatic, as I understand. In connection with the English Civil War at the Battle of Edge Hill, the bodyguard did exactly what it was designed to do, which is actually stand up and protect the king and actually his two sons, Prince Wales and the Duke of York, who were both young kids at the time. In today's world, you'd have to question, why have you got two young kids? on the field of battle. They, yeah. have, having the air and the spare. Yeah, the air and spare there, yeah. Poor decision, but yeah. they saved indeed the air. Yeah, and that's exactly what they were designed to do. And they fulfilled that role. But that is the last time they actually uh, took to the field. But they saved the future King of England from mm. the Earl of Essex troops. Yeah. So it's quite a remarkable curtain call on active service in that sense. Yes, and even more interesting actually is when Charles II came to the throne in the Restoration, he actually tried to do away with the bodyguard. He was going to disband it as a cost savings measure. Ah, oh, budget cuts, okay. Yeah. How did he not get his way then if he has to reappoint the bodyguard? It was pointed out probably it was all too difficult at the end of the day. One of those things was kick the can down the road, to use a modern phrase, in, you know, Brexit type phrase. The institution one? Yeah. Eventually, he decided it wasn't going to happen. Well, I'm glad it stuck around. I mean, look, we had a little tour of you gave me of St. James's Palace just before we started speaking today. I'm looking out the window now inside the palace. It's uh, fantastic just to be in this location and for you to have a role that's got so much history and longevity attached to it. Well, yeah, I mean, my post goes back to 1712. Your post to 1712, the bodyguard as a whole, 1509. It's yeah. amazing. Now, as we've discussed, there have been a number of actions that the bodyguard mm -hmm. was instrumental in or involved in in some way or another. But as we've also touched on, it was always intended as at least primarily a ceremonial unit. And in its early years, it was more than that. But we see history turns to settle on that more ceremonial course of action. Indeed, yeah. The last time the king, actually the sovereign, went to war and personally took command of the army in the field was at the Battle of Dettingen in the 18th century, King George II. But the bodyguard wasn't there as a close escort. It was um, left at home. Does that actually happen more over time? Because as just travel becomes easier due to technology and that kind of thing, when the sovereign goes abroad, it might just be a, a tour of the Commonwealth or the colonies, or it might be visiting the continent in some way. I imagine the bodyguard is more left at home more now because there's so much more travel. It would be impractical in a sense. I mean, we've never actually deployed abroad as a ceremonial bodyguard except on one occasion 
when two members of the bodyguard took themselves off to the Grand Burbar in 1910 at their own expense and turned up in uniform at the Delhi Durba. So you're the home bodyguard in yeah. that sort of sense, yeah. okay. In that sort of way, yeah. The bodyguard's role as close escort sort of still carried on for quite a long time. And certainly in George III's time, there are at least four attempts during his reign on assassination to assassinate him. And you're going to say to me now, OK, what did the bodyguard do about that? Well, actually, we weren't there on every time it happened. So one of them was in the Royal Opera House. One of them was on the way to the Houses of Parliament when the mob surrounded the coach and all he had was the omen of the guard there was we were at the House of Parliament waiting for him. <laughs> so he, he, but, you know, he, uh, he got through. The other one was a mad woman who, who stabbed him at Q. But the king said, it's all right, she didn't really go through. She only just damaged the waistcoat a little bit. Just a flesh wound. Just a flesh wound. Yes, to quote Monty Python. <laughs> yes, again. But the bodyguard wasn't there doing that close escort role, mainly, I think, by chance more than anything else in the way that the duty turned out and what we actually do. So, as I say, we wait for the, body, the yeoman to arrive. They seize the ground. We go in with the sovereign. But getting to the place where it's going to happen... It's usually the omen of the guard. The omen is sort of in charge in that transit period yeah. and you're there ready holding the ground for reception yeah. and then guarding during the period of activity. Yeah, then. yeah. And of course, then we've got the sort of the, the shenanigans in the 1840s uh, with the Chartist, potential Chartist riots. This was all about 1848 when it was the year of revolution across Europe. And not unsurprisingly, we had our own sort of semi-revolution here, or try to. And the mob was going to come up to town and uh, remonstrate with the Queen. And of course, St. James's Palace being the palace where the court was, we were summoned and ordered to turn out on the 10th of April and issued with musket ball ammunition and powder. Interestingly enough, at this particular stage in the bodyguard's development, they suddenly realised that of the 40 who had turned up to protect St. James's Palace, only three of them knew how to use a musket, being ex-military types. So there was a period of intense training, weapon handling drills upstairs in the state apartments where everyone then spent the night worried and wondering whether, in fact, the, the mob was going to get here. But it fizzled out because it was raining. English weather comes yeah. to the rescue. Absolutely right. But although technology changes, and we go from muskets and now guarding outside uh, the entrance here and at Buckingham Palace, you'll have officers with uh, assault rifles. You still keep the axes. Part of our history and the axes we carry today are, in fact, ceremonial pole axes. Generally speaking, go around about, back to about 1740 because we have got pictures of them at about that time. I've actually stripped a couple of them down and they've got strike mark 1742 stamped on the inside. So I'm pretty sure they're all of that period of time, uh, although they've been refurbished since then. So, Tim, we've paused our chat for a moment just to pop over to a couple of the ceremonial axes you have in the corner of your office. Can you describe all the functionality of it? We will put photos of this up on our website and social media, which you should all go check out, listeners. But while you're listening to the episode now, Tim will just describe the functionality of all the various components. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Well, the weapon itself is around about two metres high. That's from the bottom to the top to the pointy bit. It's a three-edged weapon for delivering kinetic effect, as they used to say it today, and very specific effects in different ways. So you can see it's got a pointy bit at the end there. That's really for stabbing someone through the visor, under the chin, in the armpits, the groin, thighs, anywhere where your arm is disjointed. The guy would then fall over and then you get your short sword out and sort of finish him off. So use the axe, find an opening, get yeah. him on the ground, and then use a smaller implement to, to finish him off. Do the business. Yeah. Um, the second edge is obviously the curved bit, which is the uh, chopping bit for chopping bits off. Um, uh, it's yeah, quite we, straightforward. We liken it to a clock face, the... The stabby bit you just described is pointing to 12, and yep. then at 3 is this curve, basically yeah. a choppy bit. Yeah, the axe head. The axe head, and yep. then we go round to 9 o'clock. Yeah, and at 9 o'clock you've got a piece that sticks out the back with four prongs on it. That is just a ceremonial representation of what would have been there. And in the 1630s, it's about the size of a toucan beak. That's what it's shaped like. And that is for hitting someone over the head and stunning them, hence being poleaxed. That's where the phrase poleaxed comes from, being stunned. It's being hit over the head by the, the end of the axe. Guy falls over, and then you get back to work again with your little knife, finish him off. Now, also on the axe, there are 
uh, three lovely gold and red tassels. Very pretty. Very pretty, and a set of brass studs on a velvet background. Uh, the brass studs are there, so you maintain a firm grip of the weapon once it gets all bloody when you get into this close quarter combat role. And the tassels are there to soak up the blood and the gore when you start using the axe properly. So that really, you know, it's a Swiss army knife of its day. That's what I call it. Well, I suppose, yes, if you're sticking them with the pointy bit at the top, then the tassels are actually preventing a lot of the matter going down and spilling onto your hands and causing extra slippage. And... Correct, absolutely right. A true close quarter combat weapon. It is not for receiving cavalry, which a lot of people would say, you know, it's a formal line standard receive the cavalry because it's only six foot probably two metres actually high from top to bottom. Uh, you want longer reach if you're fending off the There is absolutely no reach if you're being charged by cavalry. So uh, the Lancer will get you before you get him. So it's a close quarter combat weapon. And the sort of analogy to fighting with that, which I use uh, when I'm describing it to visitors, is that if you'll remember the film Robin Hood, Prince of Thieves, with Kevin Costner in it, and they have the fight with Little John, on the river, fighting with staves, it's quarter stave fighting, and that is dry training for close combat with the Polacks. Well, going back to medieval warfare, who were the members of Her Majesty's, or then His Majesty's mostly, bodyguard initially when it started, and how has the nature of those who comprised the guard changed over time? It started off originally as the bodyguard were formed by the sons of noblemen who could be trusted. They're also the only ones who could afford to join. You got your commission, but you had to pay for your horse. Your horses, your three servants, your kit. That's not cheap. <laughs> it's not cheap today, and it certainly wasn't cheap then. And so it was a certain strata of society with the people who could afford to join. And of course, being a noble, son of a noble, and you were quite trusted to be part of the king's bodyguard, as it was in those days. There was a trade even then, although not as naked, if you like, as it became during from the period of James II onwards when there was a serious trade in appointments. Uh, that's one of the downfalls of the bodyguard and led to change in the 1860s. You could buy your appointment, basically. Anyone could buy an appointment. It doesn't matter whether you're a civilian or military. So it was mainly civilians. It was an investment. And you sold it on 10 years later at a profit to someone else. Interestingly, after the Chartist riots, or the threat of the Chartist riot, I should say, there was a very marked movement of people out of the bodyguard who suddenly realised it wasn't quite what perhaps I'd signed up for. That it is actually potentially a bodyguard. Yeah, yeah, it potentially might have to go and do something. And an influx, again, of civilians who perhaps understood more of what they were signing up to, but they were still civilians. In the battles we were discussing earlier, there would have been the sons of those noblemen and they would have had their skills more readily honed. In oh, absolutely right. Yes, absolutely. Because it was part of life's daily toil really to be proficient with sword lance and bows and arrows and crossbows. So who is in the guard today? What's the average age? Well, so the average age a gentleman today is going to be about 55. People join at 52 and they leave at 70. Those are two, the two Adamtine rules that we have, or two of several that we have, but that's, you know, that's the latest we will let anyone join, 52. And what will their uh, background be before joining? They'll all have been regular officers in the army or the Royal Marines. Uh, the Royal Marines were allowed to join by William IV. That was his uh, decision. And he also tried to get rid of the purchase of by commission thing, not very successfully. And it took, it took Prince Albert to actually get the Queen to sign the order that says it's abolished. That then left them with a the problem of having to buy out the people who had paid money for their appointments, which they did over a period of time. And the lieutenant, they bought him out for £6,000, I think it was. So it's now quite a uniform standard or criteria to yeah, join. Yeah, absolutely right. Generally speaking, it's foot guards, the cavalry, Royal Artillery, Royal Horse Artillery, and, and the rifles. We've got two Royal Marines, as I say, and we now have an RAF group captain. Only from the RAF regiment, though. We don't take pilots because RAF regiment guys are like infantry as opposed to uh, gas jockeys. And generally speaking, because they're all retired from the army, they all have daytime jobs in industry doing whatever they do or in banking or whatever uh, their speciality is. But when we turn out for a duty, yes, we all we form up and we stand there absolutely perfectly still. And then we march off again because we are the nearest guard to the sovereign. So we will turn out for every event that the sovereign attends as a state occasion. The average bodyguard member will turn up when they're called upon, when it's required. You're different in that sense that this is your job and your, like you said, your office is here in St. James's Palace yeah. and you're keeping the wheels turning. And, and the important thing to remember is actually when a member of the bodyguard is summoned for duty, it's a royal summons. If you're on jury, you're 
for excused jury duty. It has that power still to do that. Well, when the Queen calls, you know. Yeah. Well, I think it's a comfort for our listeners to know that such a fine corps of gentlemen at arms are looking after Her Majesty the Queen and associated family members. And I'm sure you have a lot of interesting moments with the royal family, which I know you can't talk about, but... Yeah, I, we have an interesting time sometimes and every duty is different in what happens. And uh, yeah, sometimes we're caught on the hop a little bit. Let's briefly also touch on some of the extra stuff you're involved with, Tim, through this role you have. Uh, we were introduced, for example, through the connection between Australian Army cadets and UK cadets. And I know you arrange tours locally and around the Western Front battlefields and so on. By way of background, my background is that uh, I did 25 years in the Army Reserve, then transferred to the cadets and I've just about done 20 years there. In fact, no, 20, I've done 24 years there. This year, I've done 50 years service in Tolkien. With the, uh, the cadet connection, started off with a connection with the Scotch College in Melbourne, who were trying to find someone who would look after them for two weeks, so I volunteered to do that for them. And so now every two years, either we go to Australia or the Australian cadets come to us for a two or three week training period. But it, that's not just Scotch College anymore. No, no, it's... Um, it's actually now sort of shifted from Scotch down to New South Wales and the Parramatta Lancers. And even just recently, we had the 75th anniversary of D-Day, and I understand you were over in Normandy. Yes, I was running a battlefield study for my regiment on D-Day, but not about D-Day, interestingly enough, because uh, the regiment was doing a, the Guard of Honour for Prince Charles, but it still left 150 of them sort of going, oh, what do we do now? So we took them down to a place called villers Bocage, where... My regiment got very badly handled and uh, it's a nice, easy, linear battle to take them through and it took all day and they loved every minute of it. Well, Tim, it's a lot of fascinating history we've covered today and quite unlike anything we have back in Australia. I've enjoyed meeting you and learning about Her Majesty's Bodyguard of the Honourable Corps of Gentlemen at Arms and I also just enjoy saying that name. Thank you, the Axe Keeper, for speaking with me today. No problem. I enjoyed it myself. Find out more about this podcast by visiting www.lifeonthelinepodcast.com. From there, subscribe to our e-newsletter to never miss an episode. You can find us on Facebook and Instagram at Life on the Line Podcast and on Twitter at L-O-T-L Pod. Join us every Tuesday for an interview with an Australian military veteran. We speak with our nation's veterans of all ranks and service branches, from World War II to the modern era. On Fridays, we often have special bonus episodes like this conversation with Tim. I hope you enjoyed it. Life on the Line is brought to you by Thistle Productions, artwork by Big Cat Design, music by Dan Van Werkhoven. Thank you for listening, and lest we forget.